Hey, Eric here with 3540 Design Workshop. Today I'm starting another series which I'm calling Around the Studio and the plan is to record these periodically when I have some interesting things to share. Basically, it's a way for me to show you what I'm working on and what I'm thinking about right now and kind of share how I've designed my practice. So I wanna start with the maker schedule that I use in the studio. And although I'd love the practice of architecture to be completely focused on design, Running a business requires focus on other things too, but I schedule my weeks and days very rigorously and I do that to prioritize making. And here's how it goes. I divide my professional day between making and managing. Now this was originally inspired by Paul Graham's essay, Maker's Schedule, Manager's Schedule. And I'll link that up in the description. The idea is that these two polarities exist in our day that really shouldn't overlap if we can help it. So making requires deep thought, synthesis, and the space to explore ideas, while managing requires quick action and movement from one task to the next. Now, each of these modes requires very different things of us cognitively, and so it's problematic when we try and mix the two together. If we continually switch between these orbits, the time it takes to change our internal operating system is effectively lost productivity. Okay, so back to the studio schedule. For my ideal day, the making always happens in the morning hours and the managing in the afternoon. So to effectively reboot my internal operating system between these two modes, I split my day with exercise, which is usually a hike or a bike ride. So the specifics, I wake up around 5 a.m. each day, grab a coffee, then head here into the studio where I either write or work on the last design task from the previous day. I don't check email and I want to really stress this. It's really important. A well-rested mind shouldn't be turned to work on emails or other mindless tasks. You want to save those for the afternoon. For me, I know my best ideas will come either early in the morning or when I'm exercising. So mornings are dedicated creative time. Now I'll work until about 1.30 in the afternoon when I break from my hike or bike. And then I use this time to listen to podcasts and I always carry a sketchbook to record any ideas that come while I'm out. There's this synergy between exercise and listening to the ideas of others that's like this imagination serum for me. So tying this creative infusion with exercise has the effect of making me crave the time away from my drafting table. After exercise, it's back to the studio where I'll check and respond to email, return phone calls, edit photos or videos, or attend meetings, basically any management task that needs doing. Now I try to end the work day with some form of education, whether it's a master class or a book I'm reading or a stroll around YouTube. This basically ensures that I'm filling up the reserves with new ideas and inputs. Now I usually leave the studio around 6.30 most evenings, and before I do, I'll check the schedule for the next day to see what I'll be making when I get in. That way, I can get right to work on what's important. Now, I like to have a weekly plan, which I map out in Evernote every Sunday night. This allows me to precisely state what I plan to accomplish by the end of the week and sensibly divide it up into daily goals. Without this, it's too easy to fritter away time and finish the week having completed many tiny tasks that don't actually move the practice forward. Now, this is an ideal day, as I said. Does every day look like this? No, but the idea is to be intentional about where I invest my creative energy. For you, it's important to know the schedule and the times that elicit your best work and design your schedule around that. Above all, prioritize making things. So precisely, what am I working on in the studio? While the Squid Cove residence is progressing in spite of a brief weather delay, we're hoping to finish the exterior framing and dry the building in very soon. Having designed the exterior shell package, I'm now turning my attention to finalizing the interior design package. So I select everything from the faucets and the door hardware to the tile and the paint colors. So there's a lot of decisions to be made. I met with a client a week or so ago to review the interior design direction and the material palette. We focused on the kitchen and living module first as those spaces have a lot of critical systems integrations which will impact our framing layouts. Following framing, the rough-in work will begin with the plumbers, the mechanical subs, and the electricians all competing for space. And the open plans that we design often mean few interior partition walls and places to hide things like plumbing vents or duct runs, so this can be a challenging phase. We'll be following this project throughout construction and examining the design and materials along the way. Much of my maker's time last week was spent overhauling my website. A week ago Sunday, I broke it. 
I knew it needed a refresh and I had been procrastinating because I knew the potential was there to completely destroy it. I purchased a new WordPress theme, I installed it, I fussed with it for a couple of days, and then unhappy with the results, I put back the old one, which by this point, unfortunately, no longer looked like the old website. So after I found myself Googling WordPress templates that look like Squarespace, I thought, what am I doing? Why don't I just use Squarespace? So I did, and I've been a serious fanboy of WordPress for a long time, but now having used both, I can wholly endorse Squarespace. So if you need a website, and you do, here's a few reasons that I chose Squarespace. Number one, limited customization. Whereas WordPress offers near infinite customization, Squarespace does not. The redesign exercise reminded me that infinite options can be an absolute disaster in the hands of someone who knows just enough to be dangerous. Having previously customized my site made it difficult to know what exactly I had to change in the updated one. Now, number two, site load speed. I had a dozen or more different plugins, menus, and scripts running in WordPress, and all of that was on shared hosting. So in the eyes of Google, my site wasn't a very high ranking one, and I could see my page views suffering as a result. Search ranking directly affects business development. Number three, I like clean, minimalist design and Squarespace's templates deliver, and they work right out of the box. Transferring a domain, redirecting URLs, and exporting posts isn't for the faint of heart, but it also isn't that difficult. Sure, some headaches, but the benefit is that the website is now something I'm looking forward to updating, and I can critically answer the question that every architect must, which is, what is the one thing I want a visitor to do on this page? I want to mention too that my friend Robert Yuen with monograph.io is doing some amazing things with his hosted websites designed just for architects. Why didn't I choose his? No e-commerce plugin. Not everyone needs it, but it's an integral part of my business model and it's baked in with Squarespace. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about marketing. Now this isn't something that they teach architects in school, but I spend probably half of my time on marketing. Rather than the dull exercise you might think, I've come to really enjoy the game of marketing because I treat it as I do everything else in the studio as a design project. The website redesign is part marketing, part making, but so too is publication and promotion. A couple of things to report on this front. I learned last week that Dwell Magazine, who was initially interested in publishing the studio project, has regretfully passed. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed. However, I'm encouraged in part by this YouTube channel and the reality that self-publishing your work is not only possible, but it's the best way to control your brand's message. The internet has democratized access to self-publication, and there are fewer and fewer gatekeepers each year. The publishing industry is still playing like it's the late 1990s rather than 2017. And this is what I would say to anyone watching who's having trouble getting published. When these guys don't accept your work, publish it yourself. To YouTube and Amazon, iBooks and Instagram, those are places where you'll own the messaging, the branding, and also the profits. Now, rather than take this as a ding on the ego, I'm trying to feel empowered by the opportunity. That said, I'm still shopping it around to other publications. So more updates on this soon, hopefully. Now, I want to mention that having a professional photographer on board to reach out to their network on your behalf is immensely valuable. They have the connections that architects lack. So we also had another photo shoot, this one inside our home, the original Longhouse. And this one will be featured in a new magazine called Down East Homes, which is published here in Maine. And I'm pretty excited to see the images that come out of it soon. On the education front, the Netflix original series, Abstract, The Art of Design, you have to binge watch this. These are beautifully filmed 45 minute deep dives on an individual's design process. There are eight in season one. My favorite episodes so far are Ilsa Crawford interior design and Platone photography. Fantastic stuff, so check it out. Lastly, some channel news. I'm receiving a lot of viewer questions, so I have a backlog there to respond to, but please do keep messaging me. I love hearing from you all, and I may have to do a YouTube live to answer these all at once. Some other videos in the works. I have a fantastic bag to review. I have some new books, I have some products, a continuation of the model making series, which has been pretty popular. And I also wanted to mention Matt Reisinger of the Build Channel based in Austin, Texas. He and I linked up via Skype recently and I really admire what he's doing on YouTube. He's basically self-publishing his own television show, 
with a really lean team. He puts out a ton of content e each week. And if you appreciate what I'm doing here, please be sure to also subscribe to his channel. I'll link it up in the description. In his words, it's a channel dedicated to architect-driven, finely crafted homes. He works exclusively with architects and his videos often feature the architects he's collaborating with. So you'll hear both the practical builder's perspective as well as the architects. His channel is sponsored by some big names in our industry and he's inspired me to pursue a similar path for this channel, which will help me to continue to make and improve the content I'm producing. And I wanna close with a thank you for all to all of you for continuing to watch and support this channel. I couldn't do this without you, obviously. Viewership growth has some serious velocity this year and I'm really excited to see where it leads us in 2017. Cheers.